Alrighty, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to a super early view of tonight's lunar eclipse. My name is Kyle Denny, and I'm one of the team members here at High Point Scientific. And tonight, I'm also joined by Scott Mitchell, director of the Orange Coastal College Planetarium in Costa Mesa, California. And Scott, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about what you do at your planetarium and how excited you are for this total lunar eclipse. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Mitchell. Uh, like Kyle said, I'm the director of the planetarium here at Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa, California. Uh, and it's you know my job to teach people about the sky and outer space, and that's exactly what we are doing tonight. Usually, uh, I get to do this from inside the planetarium dome where we simulate the sky, uh, but tonight we're fortunate enough to be able to. Uh, I've got a telescope out here set up in the parking lot, pointed at the moon and uh, we will be watching the moon pass into the Earth's shadow over the next couple of hours. So real excited uh, to be able to uh, to share this with all of you, because I know uh, a lot of you are probably on the East Coast. You're not going to be able to see the moon live, but uh, if you're here on the West Coast like I am, you can go outside right now and uh, and take a look over the next, what, three uh, three hours, I think, before the moon starts to set. We'll see it go through totality. So. Good deal. Lots of fun. Good deal. Well, thanks for introducing yourself, Scott, and this is super, super exciting. We have about 8 minutes and 50 seconds until the partial eclipse begins. The partial eclipse uh, is basically when the Earth's shadow begins to cross the lunar surface, so slowly during the view, you'll see more and more of the moon just get biting out from the uh, shadow of the Earth. So. We have 8 minutes and 30 seconds, but you can also see some of the moon going dark already as the Earth begins to enter the outer region of the Earth's shadow. Or excuse me, the moon enters the outer region of the moon enters the outer region of the Earth's shadow. I apologize, guys. Earth's I'm shadow. very tired this morning. <laughs> so yeah. Oh yeah. So we'll be answering your me, questions. Me too. It's 2:30 over here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, man. I feel you. So. We'll be answering your questions about the eclipse as it happens. Uh, we have two separate views set up tonight. We have a view that you're looking at right now out of Tucson, Arizona. And we also have a view that Scott has gone ahead and set up for us. As you can see, Scott is dealing with some clouds this morning. Uh, both sides have been sort of clouded out by uh, just uh, high clouds and just thick, you know, thick puffy clouds that are going through the image and just making things a little difficult. So. We'll be switching back and forth as needed, but right now Scott's looking pretty clouded out. But we do have a pretty solid view from uh, our Tucson location, so this is fantastic. And again, you can see a little bit of that um, Earth shadow being across the lunar surface. So this is really fantastic. So if you're watching though, we have a few people watching already. Uh, if you're watching and you have any questions about astronomy, the nighttime sky, the lunar eclipse, what this lunar eclipse is, what it means, uh, feel free to ask them in the comments and be more than happy to answer them. Uh, one thing I also like to do is give a, well, hold off on a little bit for that, but yeah. Uh, Scott, so while I have you here and we're waiting for clouds to pass your view of the moon, uh, could you tell us a little bit about a lunar eclipse, how a lunar eclipse works, and what are sort of the steps to a lunar eclipse? What are we looking at right now, and what are we expecting to see this evening? Yeah, so in uh, the most basic sense, a lunar eclipse is when the moon passes through the shadow of the Earth. Uh, so as I think most people know, the moon doesn't give off any light of its own. All of the light that we see coming from the moon is just reflecting off of the moon's surface coming from the sun. Uh, so normally when we have a, a nice big full moon, the moon is either kind of above or below the Earth's shadow just a little bit so that it doesn't pass through the shadow. But when the Earth, the moon, and the sun all line up just right, the moon can pass right through the Earth's shadow. Uh, and there are a couple of different parts uh, to uh, you know, the eclipse and the Earth's shadow itself. The outer region of Earth's shadow is called the penumbra, it is kind of a, a lighter shadow shadow where it's not blocking all of the sun's light uh, and then the middle of this kind of you know circular shadow going straight back from the earth uh, is the umbra and that's the darkest part of the shadow and during a total lunar eclipse which is what we've got going on tonight 
the moon is going to pass directly through the Earth's umbra. So it'll be completely covered by the darkest part of uh, the Earth's shadow. And then after passing through the umbra, it'll go back into the other side of the penumbra. And then gradually that will move back across the moon and it'll be back in the full sunlight. Good deal. Good deal. So... So what is it like to see a lunar eclipse, though? We, we heard a lot of technical details about what, it's, what we expect to see, but what's the experience like? What do you see? Do the stars come out? Do the, uh, does the moon go away? Does the moon suddenly turn into a giant monster in the sky, as the media seems to like <laughs> to portray it as? What is the experience like of a lunar eclipse? Uh, so lunar eclipses aren't particularly rare. Uh, we It has been uh, quite a while since we've had a total lunar eclipse. I think the last one was January 2019. Uh, but it is a really, really cool uh, experience to be able to see, you know, especially with your own eyes, if you can see it. Uh, anybody on the nighttime side of the Earth uh, while the eclipse is happening will be able to see it. Uh, and if you're lucky and the conditions are all just right, the moon gets really dark and then it'll start to turn kind of red uh this is where we get the the blood moon that the media really likes to talk about uh which sounds a lot scarier than it is uh the red color is actually the exact same phenomenon that turns clouds you know orange and pink and red uh at sunrise and sunset the sunlight that's passing through the earth's atmosphere kind of gets filtered out and what makes it all the way through the earth's atmosphere is just the red light and so when we see the moon turning red that's that's because only the red light coming from the sun is passing through the edges of Earth's atmosphere and shooting out and hitting the moon. Good deal, good deal. So I've switched, I've quickly switched back to Scott's view, but right now uh, you probably noticed that both <laughs> Tucson, Arizona, and Costa Mesa are clouded out. Uh, we're fighting clouds on two separate locations, so that's kind of annoying. So we're doing our best to switch between the two views as they become available. So. But that was a fantastic breakdown, and it's really interesting because they I've been seeing the media call this a super blood flower moon or something like that. So yeah. people ask us, they're like, what is the heck is that? And so it's good to have an explanation. Um, but tonight is a super moon, and tonight is mm-hmm. also a flower moon. Uh, could you explain what a super moon is as well as the flower moon? Yeah, so the moon orbits around the Earth, and it does so approximately once every month. And its orbit around the Earth is not a perfect circle. Just like any orbital thing, you know, the planets around the sun, satellites around the Earth, all the different moons around the planets are elliptical, which means that they're just kind of squished a little bit uh, from being a perfect circle, which means that sometimes the moon is going to be closer to the Earth, and sometimes it's going to be uh, a little bit further away. What we call a supermoon is when you have a full moon coinciding with that point where the moon is closest to the Earth in its orbit, called its apogee. Uh, sorry, perigee. Perigee is when it's closest. <laughs> apogee is when it's furthest away. Uh, so when you have a full moon at perigee, that's when you get a supermoon. And uh, I think it gets it gets a little bit blown out of proportion. Everyone freaks out about the supermoon. It's really only about seven percent bigger uh, width-wise than an average full moon and only about uh, 14% bigger than what uh, you hear a lot less about as a micro moon, which is when you have a full moon at apogee, when the moon is furthest away, so it appears the smallest. So right now we've got you know two pretty cool things uh, lining up. We've got the total lunar eclipse, the blood moon that's going to turn it red, and then we also have the the super moon when it's you know as close as uh, as the moon ever gets to us, which makes this pretty cool. And then the flower moon is just what we call the full moon in May. Uh, Since we get a new full moon every month, uh, we've decided to name each month gets a different full moon uh, name, and the May is the flower moon. Good deal. Good deal. So, folks, if you're just tuning in and you're wondering where the heck's the moon, uh, both locations (laughs) right now are completely overcast. I'm seeing a little bit of a hint of the moon coming from Scott's view, though, so I'll quickly switch to there. So you can just see a hint of the moon. It's very noisy, very grainy looking, and that's not to be surprised simply just because um, as the clouds pass in front of the moon, they make things really dark, and it makes it very difficult for sensors to be able to pick it up. And there it goes again. (laughs) 
So yeah. it looks like we're we're headed almost into the thickest part of these clouds, and then it's just clear skies. So if we get you know another hopefully you know five or ten minutes i should have nice clear skies good deal good deal so we're about 15 seconds away from the start of the partial lunar eclipse phase again the partial lunar eclipse is when the earth's shadow begins to slowly cross the surface of the moon slowly turning it sort of that blood red color it's going to look really exciting to see once we get those views back which scott just mentioned should be back here very very soon so we got a couple of people commenting in the comments we have Xavier saying, blood moon, question mark. The end is near. Just kidding. Keep up the good work. <laughs> well, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks. And we're really exciting to be streaming tonight. Um, Blanca says, there are no clouds here in Brentwood. That is really, I'm really jealous of you right now because uh, there's plenty <laughs> of clouds at both our locations. Let me see if Vince has a view of it back. Yeah, we're both, both views are sort of just clouded out right now. So it's, uh, it is what it is. Uh, you know, we do everything to get set up. We try our best here, but when nature really has it out for us, which it seems to have it out for us tonight, you know, there's very little you can do. So it is what it is. Um, but I have, we see how, I see we have about 30 people watching right now. So for anybody watching, uh, give a, uh, quick chat, a quick comment in the chat from where you're viewing the lunar eclipse from. It's really interesting to see all of the different people from across the world tuning into these live streams, getting to see you guys, getting to interact with you guys. It always makes my day. So if you're in the if you're watching, type in the comments really quick what you're seeing, or excuse me, your location, and I will shout it out as it comes up. We have Rhonda from Cloudy in Kentucky. We can't even see the moon. <laughs> so at least we're not alone. <laughs> so checking in from Kentucky there. There's a, a joke in astronomy that you can uh, predict when it's going to be cloudy based on whenever somebody buys a new telescope. As soon as you buy a new telescope and you get real excited to bring it outside, you know it's going to be overcast for the next month. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, I tell you, I, I, someone must have bought a huge telescope out west because this, <laughs> both locations are clouded out tonight. So we have, we have Mary checking in from New Jersey. Hello, Mary. And again, if you're just tuning in, we're looking at a live view of tonight's lunar eclipse as it begins. Uh, tonight's lunar eclipse. A live, a live view of clouds right now. A live now. view of but clouds. But hopefully not for too much longer. Very good. So, <laughs> They're moving. They're moving. I can see the edge. Very good. So, yeah. So we, are, we have just begun the partial phase of the eclipse. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to take away that little ticker at the top and uh, readjust my timer to account for when the totality will begin. So I will be away just a moment, Scott, but if there's anything else you'd like to share mm -hmm. about the uh, lunar eclipse, this would be a good time to share it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like we've been uh, talking about, if you uh, maybe missed the beginning, uh, we're looking at a lunar eclipse where the moon passes through the shadow of the Earth. Uh, we are just entering the partial eclipse phase where the moon is just beginning to enter the umbra, the darkest part of the Earth's shadow. And, oh, computer, we are definitely not going to restart now. <laughs> oh, man. Don't want that. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so the over the course of the next couple of hours, the moon's going to pass right through the middle of the Earth's shadow. Uh, these uh, lunar eclipses aren't particularly rare. There's uh, you know two about two times every year uh, where the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun line up just right, so that the Moon goes through at least part of the Earth's shadow. Uh, though we haven't had a nice total, uh, you know, umbral eclipse of the Moon since January 2019. So. Uh, this is, uh, it's it's good to be able to, well, hopefully when the clouds go away, be able to see it. Um, I'll mention that this, uh, so this is a lunar eclipse, an eclipse of the moon, uh, as opposed to a solar eclipse, where kind of the Earth and the moon are in opposite positions. Uh, in a solar eclipse, the moon is between the Earth and the sun, and the moon casts a shadow on the surface of the Earth. Those are a lot harder and rarer to see because the moon's shadow is so small. It only kind of traces a line across uh, the, uh, the surface of the Earth, and if you're not on that line, then you're not going to see a solar eclipse. Um, 
this is kind of the opposite where the moon is uh, on the other side of the earth and the earth is blocking uh, sunlight from hitting it. Good deal. So I have gone ahead and update that ticker for the time for until the lunar, the totality, the total lunar eclipse begin. We have about 90 minutes or so until that happens. So it's going to be a very gradual and slow process. You can already see a good chunk of the moon already being bitten away by the earth's shadow. So that's really exciting. We have a couple of people uh, commenting uh, where they're located from. We have Elspeth. I apologize if I mispronounce your name, by the way. I'm not the best at that. Uh, checking in from the from Essex, United Kingdom. Hello from the United Kingdom. I hope you guys are enjoying the views. I think it's the middle of the day for you guys now. So obviously you guys can't see the moon. Again, this lunar eclipse is only something that's going to be visible out over the western United States, portions of Canada, Hawaii, Australia, Japan, portions of Asia, all over the Pacific. But unfortunately, those in the Atlantic and sort of European Africa side of the world will not be able to get a good view. But fortunately, those clouds have passed away from our Tucson location. So we're seeing a good clear view of the moon right now. And again, if you're just checking in, we're looking at a live view of that lunar eclipse. Feel free to share this with your friends, your family on Facebook. Just get people the word out. Get people excited about astronomy and the nighttime sky. But we also have Karen checking in from New Jersey. Total cloud cover here in northern New Jersey. Well, it's a... Uh, again, folks, you know, it's like Scott was saying. It's like whenever there's a good celestial event, you know there's just going to be clouds rolling in. So we're fighting the same problem here. We're doing our best. But it's a good deal. We have... Annie checking in from Long Beach, California. She says it's mostly clear hey. there. I can see the edge of the moon disappearing. Well, I hope you enjoy the view of the moon. We're slowly getting that view back from Scott. So he says that it'll be nice and clear here in a little bit. Uh, Xavier is checking in from Baja, California. Um, he says it's cloudy there. And we have John checking in from Dunedin, Florida. I feel like I should know that how to pronounce that because I live in Florida. Uh, but he says the moon is setting. Robert's checking in. He says, I bought a new camera today here in Huntington Beach. That's on my telescope. That probably cu cursed us here in OC. Sorry about that. Well, Robert, we know who to blame now. <laughs> Come on, Robert. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. And we have Phil watching from the UK reading. Very jealous. Looking forward to our partial solar eclipse on June 10th. That's right. There is a partial lunar eclipse visible uh, over portions of Europe and North America as part of an annular solar eclipse on June 10th. Uh, Scott, could you talk a little bit about that solar eclipse and how you know how solar e eclipses tend to come in tandem with lunar eclipses and how exactly that works? Yeah, so uh, you know, the conditions for any kind of eclipse require the Earth and the Moon and the Sun to all line up in a nice straight line. Uh, most of the time, and the reason that we don't get eclipses every single month is because the Moon's orbit is tilted a little bit, about five degrees. So usually it passes either above or below the Earth's shadow. And so right now, the sun, the earth, and the moon are all lined up in a nice straight line. And so the moon's going to pass through the shadow of the earth. And then in about uh, two weeks, the moon will go all the way around to the other side of the earth. And then, you know, it'll be almost directly between uh, the earth and the sun. And what we'll have then is a solar eclipse. Um, where the path of the eclipse, because like I said earlier, the, the shadow of the moon is so small that it only traces a path across the surface of the earth, which I think goes through uh, parts of Canada. And then you can see uh, a partial over in, uh, in Europe, uh, more northern Europe. Uh, and so the annular eclipse is when the moon uh, can't totally cover up the whole disk of the sun uh, just because of uh, its distance from the earth. Um, when the moon is, you know, really, really close to the earth, it appears bigger in our sky. And we've got our uh, super moon now. And then on the opposite side of its orbit, that's when the moon's going to be furthest away. So we'll actually have uh, kind of a, a micro new moon in about two weeks. And so the moon will be far enough away that it gets ever so slightly smaller than the apparent size of the sun in the sky. And so when they line up exactly right, you'll still see uh, the sun kind of peeking around the edge of the moon. Good deal. Good deal. 
So yeah, we can see more of the moon being sort of bitten away by the shadow of the Earth there. The eclipse has already begun. It's been gone underway for about 15 minutes or so now. So we're about around 80 minutes until totality. Give or take a little bit. I was kind of rough with my estimate there on the time. But this is so exciting to see. You know, I've seen several solar, or solar eclipses. I've seen several lunar eclipses. And each one's unique and each one's really exciting to see, you know. Um, I, I watched the last lunar eclipse in January 2019, and that was actually visible here in Florida. And it was just so cool to see the moon just slowly just sort of ebb away, and then just the beautiful red of the moon. Um, a question I hear a lot is, why is the moon red during a lunar eclipse? You may have addressed this a little bit, Scott, but could you address mm -hmm. it again? Uh, why does the moon turn red during a lunar eclipse? Yeah, so that's a very, very good question. You probably heard about, you know, the blood moon. Uh, that's what they, they keep calling it on the news and stuff uh, because the moon does turn a, a really dark shade of red. And that's because the only light that's reaching the moon is passing through the Earth's atmosphere. And if you've ever you know seen a sunrise or a sunset where all the clouds turn these beautiful colors, you know, orange and red and pink, uh, we get those colors because the sun light is coming through more atmosphere than it usually is. When the sun's directly above you, it just comes straight down through the atmosphere and you know, it gives us our nice blue sky. But when the sun is way down low on the horizon, the light has to pass through more air and the sunlight passing through the air kind of gets filtered out. Uh, so the blue light gets filtered out first until by the time it reaches us, it's uh, more red and orange. And that's exactly what's happening with the moon. The light is passing through the Earth's atmosphere and then keeps going out towards the moon. And by the time it gets to the moon, only the red light from the sun is left over. And so it uh, turns the, the moon this blood red color. And I will tell you from personal experience, it's just such an eerie f thing to see in the sky. Mm. The moon just turned just totally red like that. You know, the stars will come out that were otherwise hit rendered invisible by the light of the moon um you know and just being able to see this ghostly moon in the sky is such an eerie feeling we're slowly getting that view back from scott down in costa mesa yep. california and we can see here a more magnified view of the moon we can see a big chunk of the moon's already been taken out so this is really exciting to see we'll switch back here in a little bit as the eclipse progresses but we can see some very diff some different impact craters here a little bit such in the middle of your screen you can see uh Copernicus Crater, that is a giant impact crater on the surface of the moon, as well as Tycho Crater. And Copernicus and Tycho Craters were obviously named after two very uh, prominent uh, early astronomers, uh, Tycho Brahe and uh, uh, Copernicus. Um, and it's really cool to see those craters. And you can also see the shadow of the moon slowly uh, crossing the fa shadow of the Earth. Excuse me. I'm going to get that mixed up all all tonight it's a uh, as you can tell my voice it's very tiring here i'm out here on the east coast it's five it's a uh, 5 57 in the morning it's a uh, you know i'm going to get my words mixed up i apologize in advance so but, and i'm i'm not gonna have any pity for you at all it is 2 57 a.m in california right now even worse. so we're both sleep deprived but that's the thing about astronomy you know it's, it's a labor of love. It really is. Doing this mm -hmm. is a labor of love. So I'm willing to sacrifice as much sleep as needed to be able to bring to you guys these live views of the lunar eclipse. This is very exciting to see. So I'm going to switch back to Vince's view really quick. He's starting to get clouded out a little bit again as well. So, But you can still see that shadow of the Earth crossing in front of the face of the moon. We have about 80 minutes, give or take, five minutes or so, until the start of the lunar eclipse. The uh, totality will only last for about 13 minutes or so. This is not a uh, full central lunar eclipse which, where the moon passes in, directly in the center of the Earth's shadow. It's sort of off to the edge a little bit. Because of that, the moon won't turn deep blood red. It'll turn more of an orange color. And boy, I tell you, if you have, like I was telling you earlier, if you have a telescope, if you have a pair of binoculars even, just go outside and take a good look at the moon because it's just such an unforgettable experience. This will not be the only lunar eclipse visible over the United States this year. There will be a partial lunar eclipse visible um, over Florida and the eastern coast and all those areas that were neglected by this eclipse. We'll be able to see that one in November and also be at a, a somewhat more reasonable time for 
uh, Eastern East Coast observers. So we have that to look forward to. I believe that's on November 16th. I don't remember off the top of my head, but around there. So very good, very good. So we have some more comments coming in. Have about, again, 30 people watching. It's early in the morning for a lot of people though, so totally understandable. And yeah, we have that view of the lunar eclipse going strong here. So we're just about 78 minutes away and it's looking good. So Scott, I don't have much more to add here right now. Nope. Again, if, you have, if you're watching and you have any questions in the comments, feel free to ask them. I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, we have about 78 minutes to entertain uh, to entertain you guys here. So I think Scott's got a view back here. So let me switch back over to him. Uh, Dan's yeah, about We're coming out the other side of the, the clouds now. So it should be getting progressively better over the next couple of minutes. Good deal. Good deal. That's what we like to hear. So I'll switch over to Scott's view here really quickly. And there's a view of that shadow of the Earth moving across the face of the moon. We have Dan setting up from... He says he's about to set up my gear and watch. Hope the clouds go away. Well, Dan, you and I uh, both, buddy. <laughs> Shane checking in from Central Florida, and they're able to see a shadow of the moon that slices off the left side of the moon. Yep, that's exactly what you're going to see. And yep. unfortunately here in Florida, again, if you're watching from the East Coast, you're not going to be able to see it for too much longer because the moon's about to set. Uh, we're not far away from sunrise. I can already see the blue of the uh, dawn already making its way past my window. So the moon should be setting just about now. And we have a simulated view here of the lunar eclipse too for you guys. So I'm just quickly sharing a view with Stellarium. Again, if you're watching, uh, feel free to share your views with us using the hashtag High Point Scientific on Twitter or Instagram. That way we can uh, share some of the views you're getting of the lunar eclipse as it progresses. So Scott, I'm going to address a technical problem here really quick. So I will be right back. Okay, no problem. All right. Looks like we got just a couple more kind of thick clouds coming up my way. And then it's nothing but clear sky for hopefully a good couple of hours. But as you're uh, you're seeing now, the we've got a good chunk of the moon now inside of the Earth's umbra. That's the the center part of the Earth's shadow where it's darkest, and that is going to progressively move further and further over the surface of the moon, uh, going from left to right. And uh, yeah, and so in uh, like less than an hour now, we should be totally inside of the Earth's umbra, and uh, we'll have that nice total lunar eclipse. Um, and like Kyle was saying earlier, the uh, the moon's not going to go right through the center of the umbra. It's going to be just offset a little bit, so we won't get that really, really deep, dark red color. It'll be a little bit more uh, lightish red, kind of orange, um, but still a, a pretty fantastic thing to be able to see. Uh, and it's one of the coolest things is that you know we you know today understand what's going on. We we've been looking at the moon for you know literally you know millions of years now, uh, so we know kind of what the moon's doing we can predict these eclipses like you can go and look up a calendar of celestial events and they can list exactly what time you know every single eclipse is going to start for the next thousand years um, but it's kind of fun to think about what ancient people would have seen because they would have you know a not been distracted by television they didn't have anything else to do so they're standing outside just looking up at the moon and having absolutely no way to predict these eclipses would probably have been absolutely terrified of the moon just slowly disappearing uh, over the course of uh, you know a couple hours and uh, you hear different you know stories from all over the world different cultures uh, would uh, try and chase the, they would say that the moon's being eaten by a monster. And uh, I think in, uh, in ancient China, people would go out and, you know, bang pots and pans together to scare the, the dragon away that's eating the moon. Uh, and then of course, you know, as the moon passes through the shadow, it comes back uh, and they, uh, they had successfully chased off uh, the dragon. 
So, you know, these, these sky events are kind of a really cool way to you know, go across cultures because everybody on the whole planet is looking at the same sky. We're all looking at the same moon, uh, whether you're in Europe, Africa, North America, South America, Asia, Australia, uh, it's the same thing. And, you know, we're all looking at it and we can interpret it different ways and it you know, brings us together a little bit. Good deal. So um, I'm back again. Uh, we're addressing a technical problem on our Tucson stream. So we're hoping to get that view back for you in a little bit. Scott's saying the view will clear here in a bit for his view in California, and it's already starting to look to go away. But in the meantime, I've switched to a simulated view of the moon uh, thanks to Stellarium. Now, Stellarium's a really useful piece of software. It's completely free, and I believe it's open source. Um, and it will allow you to be able to look at things like lunar eclipses, solar eclipses. It has a catalog of incredible database of stars. And that's what we're looking at right now is to be able to sort of see a simulated view of the lunar eclipse. Again, clouds are sort of really messing with us tonight. And it is what it is. But um, now, is your, now is your chance if you're watching to go outside and just take a look if you have a view of the moon. If you're not already out watching. Because it's just such a beautiful thing to see in the sky. So we I'll throw in my own plug for Stellarium. Stellarium is such a cool program. Uh, you know, for this last year, uh, of course, the, the planetarium has been closed and I've been doing virtual field trips over Zoom and stuff. And Stellarium is the, the program that I use for virtual planetarium field trips. It lets you do so many cool things and explore the night sky and learn constellations. You can set the sky in Stellarium for any date and time anywhere in the world. So if you wanted to see exactly what the sky looked like on you know, the moment of your birth, you can do that. Uh, and it's just such a cool program. It's totally free. And I highly recommend if you're interested at all in learning more about the sky, uh, you check out Stellarium. Good deal. So you mentioned a little bit about the pandemic and planetarium. So I got to ask, so what's a lot of people don't realize this, but the museums and the planetariums for the past year have all been closed. Like nobody's mm -hmm. going to, nobody's able to go to the planetariums. Nobody's going to go to these museums during these pandemics. So I'm wondering, are you opening back up now or how are things going at your planetarium now that the pandemic is sort of slowly but surely coming in our rear view mirrors? Yeah, thank God for that. We are, uh, I'm really, really looking forward to being able to reopen. Uh, we've still got a couple of months before we will be able to do so. Uh, right now we're targeting the uh, end of August, beginning of September. Uh, since uh, our planetarium is uh, at a, a college, we're at a, a community college in Southern California. Uh, all of my staff are uh, students, and uh, so you know, over more than a year being closed, uh, almost all of my student assistants that I had before the pandemic have graduated and left. So uh, this summer, we're going to be hiring and training a whole bunch of, uh, of new uh, students from right here at Orange Coast College, and then hopefully in the fall, we'll be ready to, uh, to reopen and uh, get the public back in and start dazzling people with uh, star shows once again. Good deal. Good deal. And yeah, things have been just been pretty difficult out there in the planetarium community. It's just, it's been a tough year for all these planetariums and museums out, out there in the, uh, in the world, in the United States. So it's really exciting to be able to see um, these planetariums, these museums starting to reopen slowly but surely because, you know, one of the things that get me, nothing gets me more excited about astronomy than going into a planetarium to be able to really experience the stars. Because if you have a situation like tonight where it's just tons of clouds, you know, Going to a planetarium is a guaranteed way to be able to really experience the night sky. So it's glad I'm glad to hear that you're slowly starting to open back up, and it's really exciting to be able to see things slowly but surely going back to normal. So it looks like uh, we're we're out of the woods clouds wise here in Costa Mesa. I'm trying to focus the telescope a little bit. There we go. That's pretty good. So there we've got. A good chunk of the moon missing now. Exciting. Good stuff. We are slowly getting there, folks. We have about an hour or so away until the start of the eclipse. And we're again just slowly seeing the moon turning more and more red. You can actually see a little, see a little bit of a hint of that reddish color that Scott was talking about earlier. Slowly making itself known as the shadow of 
the Earth makes its way across the surface of the moon. Now, one thing I wanted to notice really quickly, and Scott, maybe you can talk a little about this, but I noticed the shadow is curved a little bit. It's not a, a straight line, which makes sense because the Earth's a um, is a sphere. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean the <laughs> the Earth is round, so it's it's obviously going to cast a circular shadow uh, out in space behind it, uh, and as the the moon passes through that, you'll be able to see the you know the shadow has a curve to it, um, which just matches the the curve of the the surface of the Earth that is now blocking sunlight uh, from hitting the moon. Uh, if if the Earth were not round, uh, then I think a eclipses would be a lot stranger and harder to predict uh and the shadow would probably be pretty different looking <laughs> very true very true so there's your evidence that the earth's not flat <laughs> we have right. a round <laughs> shadow therefore a round earth and you know this was something that was proven many many years ago uh hundreds of thousands of years ago so uh you know any flat earthers i'm sure they just turned off the stream right now so <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Robert. Robert wants to know, is the telescope changing the orientation of the lunar image? That's a good question. Um, Scott, is the uh, telescope changing the orientation of the image? Uh, nope. My, so my telescope right now is uh, showing it exactly the same way that you would see it with the naked eye. Uh, Telescopes, like uh, like you probably expected, uh, tend to flip the images upside down because of the way the lenses and mirrors work inside the uh, the telescope. Uh, but the camera that I've got hooked up to it kind of flips it back uh, so that it looks the same as it would uh, through you know, just with your your regular naked eye. Good deal. Good deal. So um, to speak to your question a little bit more, Robert. So this telescope wasn't the the other one was also showing a bit of a change in the orientation of the lunar image that's to be expected um, because they were using an altazimuth mount uh, which is different from an equatorial mount which an equatorial mount will sort of uh, keep the moon's sort of image sort of centered and won't cause it cause what's called field of view rotation which can be kind of annoying kind of tricky to deal with but yeah we will have that view from Tucson here Zoom. I am Still working on that technical issue to get that stream back up from our Tucson location, but we got a fantastic view uh, from California here, fortunately, as the eclipse begins to progress. So I'm going to step away again really quickly, uh, Scott, just to address things mm -hmm. on my end. So uh, if there's anything you more want to add or if you just want to take a quick uh, verbal break, uh, now would be a good time to do so. We can talk about some of the, uh, the surface features that uh, we can see on the moon right now. Um, so the uh, you know clearly we can see some different uh, at least shades of gray on the moon uh, you know notwithstanding the whole almost half of the moon now that's covered uh, by the Earth's shadow, uh, but just on the you know regular full moon moon you can see some areas that are light and some that are dark. Uh, the dark areas are called maria, uh, singular is a mare which is Latin for sea or ocean, uh, and they're called that because the you know ancient people that looked up at the moon uh, before telescopes were invented, saw that they were darker and flat and thought that they were actually bodies of water on the moon. And it wasn't until uh, the invention of the telescope and early astronomers like Galileo uh, pointed their telescopes at the moon and saw that these you know, dark flat areas were still you know solid ground. They're darker because they're a different kind of rock. Uh, the mare are uh, basaltic rock, the same kind of rock that you'd find at the bottom of Earth's oceans. And they would have formed you know, several you know, millions and millions and millions of years ago when lava would have cracked up from the interior of the moon and then spread across the surface and then cooled off, leaving these big, flat, dark areas. And right kind of in the middle of the lit portion, uh, you can see uh, the Mare Tranquilitatis, the Sea of Tranquility, where the very, very first humans uh, landed on the moon more than 50 years ago now. Uh, so that's the uh, Apollo 11 mission where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first ever humans to land on the moon, uh, followed, of course, by uh, five other missions that sent people to the moon over the 
a span of from 1969 when Apollo 11 landed to uh, 1972 uh, when the last mission left the, the lunar surface to head back to the Earth. And we haven't been back since, which uh, is, of course, a, a huge shame. But NASA, I know, is working on the new Artemis program to send people back to the moon, hopefully, uh, you know, by the uh, end of the decade which will be super, super, super cool. Um, the uh, name of the program, the Artemis program, uh, kind of uh, matches pretty well with the old Apollo uh, program. So in ancient Greek mythology, Apollo and Artemis are twins. Um, so uh, brother and sister. And uh, Artemis is the, the goddess of the hunt and the moon. So it's very appropriate that uh, the new program is called Artemis, and that it'll bring the uh, the first ever uh, woman to the moon. So far, only men have ever walked on the moon, and uh, of course, NASA wants to uh, to fix that. So the the first Artemis mission to land on the moon will definitely include the uh, the first female astronaut to walk on its surface. Good deal. So. Checking in again, uh, we're working on some technical issues on our end uh, with our Tucson stream. Um, we're working to get that stream back for you. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like our uh, one of our team members out there helping out with the stream lost internet connection like in the entire area during the stream. So things are looking <laughs> good, but then it's just the, uh, you know, the, you know, it's like fate. If it's not clouds, it's something else. So uh, we really appreciate his help, though. Um, it's uh, just, you know, unfortunate timing here. So I'm still working on getting that fixed. So I will be back in a little bit. Fortunately, here in Southern California, we've got uh, a nice good sized break in the clouds. We've still got some real thin high clouds that the moon is, you know, being a champ and shining right through. Um, you won't be able to see it with the, the telescope, but we've actually got a really cool halo effect going on where the moon's light as it comes back towards us uh, is being filtered through the uh, the water droplets in the clouds and it makes kind of a rainbow uh, in a, this big halo around the, uh, the moon, which is pretty cool to see. Uh, so if you know, even if you've got clouds, maybe they're thin enough that, uh, that you can go out and see that. And that's you know something you can see even you know it's you know easier to see without an eclipse going on really um, one of these uh, really really cool things where the light from the moon gets filtered through these really high clouds with the ice crystals and it makes this big halo uh, around it. But we're just on the very very edge of the last clouds in this particular cloud bank. And we've got a pretty good view right now. It's just about halfway covered uh, by the Earth's umbra, that center part of the Earth's shadow. Uh, the whole rest of the lit part of the moon that you can see is inside the, the penumbra, the, which is that lighter part of the Earth's shadow. Uh, but the, the really dark part is uh, that umbral part. Let's see if I can move our telescope a little bit and see get some better contrast on the surface here good deal i'm back again with you by the way scott uh just cool. working on that technical issue as well as some issues on the stream on my end uh but it's uh everything's going good right now i haven't noticed any serious problems occasionally the uh, encoder on obs is getting overloaded so i'm just trying to drop the uh, bit rate down a little bit but yeah gotcha. as scott was talking about we are sending uh, astronauts to the moon again in 2024 hopefully that's going to be really exciting and that's going to be with the artist artist missions with the uh nasa space launch system as well as spacex human landing system with their starship vehicle and that will be in 2024 mm -hmm. hopefully and they will be landing on the southern pole of the moon it's a very exciting time for space exploration uh we have a new era of space flight going on right now with a bunch of really cool and exciting missions to the moon as well as Mars. We had the Perseverance mission to Mars a little bit earlier. Uh, Scott, would you like to talk a little bit about the Perseverance rover? What are some of your, what what, what do you get excited about the Perseverance rover? Uh, what What is the Perseverance rover going to do? And uh, yeah. What isn't there to be excited about with the Perseverance rover? Uh, so the, the Perseverance rover landed, I think in February, I wanna say. Um, 
And uh, since then, it has been you know slowly driving around the Martian surface, uh, taking lots of pictures and sending them back to us here on Earth so that we can learn more about one of our closest neighbors in space. Um, you probably heard about the Ingenuity helicopter that was attached to Perseverance. Uh, it was deployed from the, the belly of the rovers, this little you know, tiny helicopter uh, that you know, proved that we could fly uh, aircraft on uh, Mars. Now, it's a very, very difficult thing to do because Mars' atmosphere is so much thinner than ours here on Earth. It's only about 1% the density of Earth's atmosphere. And the way that, you know, helicopters and almost all aircraft work is by using, you know, the either helicopter blades or wings to push air and generate lift. And the if there's not a lot of air, you have to push a lot more of it to get the necessary force to actually lift something uh, up into the air. So it was just a huge, huge engineering achievement uh, by the NASA JPL team to design uh, this little helicopter that's done several flights now, uh, giving us our first kind of uh, you know aerial shots of Mars, uh, aside, of course, from the, uh, the ones taken by the descent vehicles of uh, Perseverance, Curiosity, and some, uh, some of the other missions uh, that have been able to take shots on their way down. Uh, but uh, Ingenuity gave us kind of our first uh, really controlled uh, you know, in-flight pictures of the surface of Mars, which is super cool. Uh, one of the other experiments on board Perseverance that I'm really excited about uh, is called MOXIE, and its whole job is to collect carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere, which is what the atmosphere is mostly made of. Uh, so here on Earth, our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen and oxygen. On Mars, it's almost all carbon dioxide. And the MOXIE module that's installed on Perseverance brings in the CO2 and converts it into breathable oxygen. And so this is a another kind of just test thing uh, to uh, a proof of concept to prove that it is possible to generate oxygen on Mars. And so when we finally do send people there, hopefully, you know, by you know, in sometime in the 2030s, uh, you know, we'll be able to have you know, huge versions of this moxie thing uh, that'll be able to generate oxygen for uh, for the astronauts there. Um, so yeah, the Perseverance is a super, super cool mission that's got a ton of work uh, left to do. Uh, one of my favorite just kind of weird facts about it, uh, because uh, Perseverance is not powered by solar panels like some of the earlier Mars rovers, uh, this one has a, uh, a nuclear uh, you know, generator on it to produce all of its electricity. Uh, and because it was carrying the Ingenuity helicopter, that technically makes Perseverance a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. So we landed a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier on Mars this year, and I think that's fun. That's so cool. You know, it just amazes <laughs> me some of the really exciting engineering uh, feats that NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory does. Um, Although I don't get a view of the lunar eclipse tonight, I am blessed with the fact I live in Florida and I can see these launches in person. I didn't get to see the Perseverance launch due to COVID, but uh, I did get a chance to see the uh, Curiosity rover launch. And if you're down there in Florida, just go out and watch one of these rocket launches because it's one of the coolest, most exciting things you can see. Just seeing something built by humans to explore the cosmos, launching from Florida, feeling that rumble in your chest. Uh, I remember watching the Curiosity rover. I'm just thinking, going to Mars. I was like, wow, that's going to Mars. I just saw something going to Mars. So that's always a really cool and exciting experience. Definitely check it out. If you ever do get a uh, chance to visit Florida, they launch rockets pretty regularly here, including uh, the upcoming NASA Ar Artemis missions. So exciting times in space exploration. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're that, the lunar eclipse is still progressing. We have about 55 minutes away. If you're outside looking at the moon right now, if you have a view of the moon, you might notice it kind of looks like a crescent as the uh, uh, the Earth's shadow begins to go further and further across the surface of the moon. We can also see, if my eyes do not deceive me, a hint of that red of the surface of the moon coming out. So that's really exciting to see. Uh, again, the... Uh, the blood moon is making itself known, as the media would might like to say. So this is super, super exciting. Again, if you're just tuning in, you're looking at a live view of tonight's lunar eclipse. And so 
again, I'm still working on some issues on my end here, Scott. So just making sure everything's uh, stable, yeah. apparently having some audio problems. So I'm trying to address that. So if Scott, if you just want to keep talking, I'm yeah. going to try to go ahead and get that fixed. Cool, cool, cool. I can talk more about just space, you know, space travel in general uh, always really excites me. Um, you know, I, I'm jealous, of course, uh, you know, Kyle living in Florida, you know, not far from Cape Canaveral, where all of you know, these most of the rockets are being launched. Uh, if you're uh, here with me in Southern California, we do have an occasional launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, that can be visible sometimes. I remember one uh, a couple of years ago, it was a SpaceX launch from Vandenberg. Uh, and when they time it just right so that it's just after the sun goes down, uh, and you'll see this, you know, <laughs> if you didn't see it in person, you'll see it all over the news the next day uh, where the rocket goes up and when the uh, the exhaust uh, when the rocket gets high enough in the earth's atmosphere it gets kind of above the earth's shadow and the exhaust plumes get lit up by the sunlight and it creates this huge really colorful uh, cloud around the rocket uh, that you know if you don't know what you're looking at people you're driving on the highway freak out and think it's aliens uh, but those are really really cool to see uh, unfortunately they're not as common uh, launching from uh, from vandenberg it's uh, the they only launch from uh, Vandenberg when they're trying to do a polar orbit that goes over the north and south pole of the Earth uh, because they can launch south over the ocean. So if there's a problem with the rocket and it crashes, uh, then it just lands uh, in the water, uh, which is the same reason that they launch most other things from Florida. They launch it east over the Atlantic Ocean. So if there's a problem, crashes in the middle of the water and there's you know no chance of it landing on people. Um, so, yeah, the uh, the Artemis program, the Artemis missions to land people back on the moon, uh, those are all going to go from uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida, and uh, they're headed for the south pole of the moon, which is definitely different from where the Apollo missions were headed. They kind of you know, were scattered all over the near side of the moon, the side of the moon that faces towards us. Um, but the Artemis missions are going to be focusing on the lunar south pole because there are craters there that are deep enough that the light from the sun never reaches the bottom, which means that there is a constant supply of ice that's just been frozen for you know basically eternity uh, at the bottom of these craters. And ice is a very, very, very valuable thing in space travel because you can break it down into uh, oxygen, which you know, is important if you, you know, feel like breathing, and uh, hydrogen, which is used for rocket fuel. Uh, so if we can establish a, a permanent uh, presence at the south pole of the moon uh, in one of these craters, then we have just a huge, huge supply of breathable oxygen and rocket fuel that can allow the moon to be kind of a stepping stone out into the rest of the solar system. Uh, it's you know, really hard to launch rockets from the Earth because the Earth has that pesky atmosphere and a lot of gravity. If we can launch stuff from the moon instead, then that you know cuts out just a ton of work. Uh, you know the rockets don't have to be as big, uh, and it really opens up the whole rest of the solar system for us. Uh, so that's why Artemis is headed for the South Pole. Good stuff. Uh, Shane brought up a really interesting comment here. He says uh, SpaceX is set to launch today at two fifty nine p.m. More satellites. Good for some, bad for us who are into electrically assisted astronomy or astrophotography. And Starlink satellites are a source of concern for a lot of people. Um, I don't know about you, Scott, but a lot of people, a lot of astronomers are very worried that if they're doing astrophotography, mm -hmm. you know, those views of the uh, the night sky might be ruined by the Starlink satellite. What's your thoughts on the uh, Starlink satellites and mega constellations in general? Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that I'm really conflicted about uh, because I just personally really really love rockets i think rockets are super cool satellites are super cool and uh i love you know anything that you know helps advance you know human engineering and sending things that we made into space um and the starlink uh program in general is you know 
in uh, you know in its core a really you know useful thing for humanity. Uh, the goal is to be able to provide uh, internet to anywhere in on the earth so if you're you know in super underdeveloped uh you know countries where you know just getting electricity is hard you could get high speed internet uh with a uh, a starlink connection which you know is is great for you know lifting you know different regions of the world out of poverty getting everyone connected all over the world um so in in that sense it's really really powerful but on the other hand uh you know, having all of these constellations of satellites uh, is what they call them. They're you know, just huge collections of satellites that orbit around the Earth together uh, do make it harder to uh, observe the sky because uh, these satellites you know, reflect light from the sun. And so they look like you know, moving stars. And if you're trying to do long exposure astrophotography, then you know, occasionally you'll get these streaks that go across your really nice image uh, as the satellites move between uh, your telescope and the sky. Uh, and that, that can be a huge huge pain and there's only going to be more of them uh as uh you know as we move further into the future we're going to be launching more and more and more of these satellites not just uh starlink but all kinds of other uh, mega constellations of satellites as well uh, and people are concerned that uh, that it'll affect our view of the night sky um i know that uh you know spacex specifically is uh, working to reduce the uh, the albedo or the reflectiveness of their telescopes, so yeah, they paint them uh, black and try and make sure they're reflecting as little light as possible. But uh, they're they're still definitely visible after a Starlink launch. Uh, if you're in the right place at the right time, you can actually see a train of these satellites going across the sky in a nice straight line, just you know one dot after another, uh, which you know, on its own is is kind of cool to see. Um, but the you know the real the real issue is if you want to take uh, images of the sky, uh, you know professional research astronomers that have these massive massive telescopes uh, are you know legitimately concerned that uh, all of these satellites are going to affect uh, their view of the cosmos and it you know, could easily hamper astronomical research. Um, the way around that is to launch uh, telescopes into orbit. Uh, you know, things like the the Hubble Space Telescope doesn't have this problem because it's you know above all of these satellites, and it uh, you know its view isn't obscured. Uh, and then hopefully in the next couple of years, the James Webb Space Telescope will launch, and that's kind of the the successor to Hubble. And that's not even going to be in uh, Earth orbit. We're going to put that at one of the uh, Lagrange points uh, of the Earth. So it's in this like stable spot uh, way out in space uh, that uh, will be uh, isolated from you know background noise from the Earth and give us some really, really, really cool uh, images of uh, the universe around us. Good deal. So that's my, my real long-winded you know, thoughts on Starlink. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, Starlink's a, also a source of controversy for me as well. I think about Starlink satellites and I'm thinking about all of the good that they can bring. In my opinion, they can bring a lot of good, not just to, uh, you know, astronomers looking for internet connection, but for people out in rural areas, especially <laughs> now that we live in a virtual sort of post-pandemic world, uh, being able to connect to a stable source of Wi-Fi. Right now, a lot of these people out in the middle of nowhere are paying a lot for not very good internet connection and that's not very good especially if you have like a virtual school situation going on where your kids are at uh you know distance learning and it can be tough without a stable internet connection for these people so i think there's a lot of good that can come from starlink but there is some legitimate concerns about the impact that starlink's going to have on astronomy in the nighttime sky it's not a huge concern for people looking at these uh for amateur astronomers because amateur astronomers can if they're doing astrophotography they can always stack out the starlink satellites but yeah it's a it's a concern and a big one for the uh, professional astronomy community the professional astronomy community just being you know you get one satellite that goes through the image and then your sensor will just get overloaded by this light from the satellite because these telescopes are huge and these sensors are super sensitive so something that could be uh seen really really faint in the sky will just be completely overblown in the sensor of a large astronomical research telescope so that's where the huge concern lies is getting those views up 
So we have another comment here from Sue. Sue says, I've seen the Starlink train on two separate nights. Have to say it was fun to watch. But yes, concerns about all of those satellites up there from an astronomy standpoint. And we echo those concerns as well. So we're about 44 minutes away from the start of the totality uh, phase. If you go outside and you have a view of the lunar eclipse, this is about the time where you would be able to see the sort of blood red moon. So that's really, really cool to see. If you didn't know any better, you'd probably look out and say, oh yeah, that's just a normal crescent moon. But this is actually a full moon right now. Uh, it's just that the uh, the Earth is in the way and it's blocking some of that sunlight from getting to the moon's surface. So you can maybe see, depending on your uh, your internet connection, see the edge of the moon even in the dark uh, dark area. And hopefully that'll brighten up a little bit. Well, as the, the rest of the moon gets darker, the uh, the dark part of the moon will be more easily visible. And hopefully we'll get some of that red color. Good stuff. So um, how's the weather looking now for you, Scott? Are you clear yet? Or is it uh, still clouds coming and going? It looks like it's been clear for a while. Yep. Yeah, it's been clear for uh, probably, I don't know what time is it now? It's probably been 20 minutes clear. Uh, we've got some hazy clouds it looks like way over on the uh, the southwestern horizon coming in that might ruin our day but uh, i think we've got at least another half hour before those start to uh, be a problem good deal good deal so we're about about 40 minutes away from that total period uh the totality begins if i'm not mistaken at uh 7 11 26 a.m eastern but that'll obviously be below the horizon here for eastern observers so that is uh, I think what four four, four, four twenty seven here four yeah four eleven or something around that time four eleven so we still got a little bit to go about forty five minutes away until that starts so but you so we're in a race between the shadow of the moon and these clouds I know it's uh <laughs> it is what it is so folks again if you're tuning in it's so great to see you guys all here we're all excited about the eclipse uh, it's great to be able to talk to you guys. Uh, we know it's early in the morning, so not everybody is up and able to enjoy the views of the eclipse. Uh, I figure some of you are probably tuning in to are about to go to work or something like that. So it's great to be able to talk to you guys and get you guys excited about astronomy in the nighttime sky. So right now we're just sort of in a waiting phase for that eclipse to really get going here and it looks super beautiful. Scott, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but things are looking good on my end, technically. I'm still waiting to get that Tucson feedback, um, working with our team members out at uh, our Tucson facility to be able to really figure out what went wrong there. So it looks like it wasn't their fault, it was a problem with just the internet service in general, just totally went out. I'm also having some problems on my end with my computer, the uh, CPU, is ha can't handle all these different streams, so it's getting overheated, <laughs> and um, I'm having an encoder problem. So if you're hearing the audio occasionally going out, that's why. I'm trying my best to fix it, so I'm still working on getting that done. So, and I think I have it good now, but it's still going out occasionally. But we're trying our best here. This is the longest I probably have done a stream, so it's just a uh, trial and error, you know. I'm just glad it's working on my end. Yeah, you're like whatever you know, whatever I seem to do that there's always a problem on my end and so far it's going pretty smooth. Uh, I was really worried at the start of the stream because as soon as I set up my laptop, uh, I decided to start doing all these crazy updates. Uh, so I was terrified about that, but it it finished doing those updates just in time to start the stream and it doesn't look like I've had any problems since then. <laughs> and Scott, this is a fantastic view. Can you tell us a little bit about your setup? What telescope you're using? What camera are you using? And uh, how are you connecting it to your laptop? Uh, so right now I have a uh, kind of uh, 
interesting setup. Uh, I had originally intended to use, I've got a 12-inch uh, uh, Mead telescope on an uh, Altaz mount, uh, but it turns out that the focal length of that telescope is just too big. Uh, and so if I put the camera on the main scope here, uh, we would only be able to see a tiny little section of the moon just because of the you know, the zoom was so, so high. Um, so I've actually got a uh, little plastic, almost toy Galileo scope uh, that I kind of jury rigged and crammed into the finder scope mount on, uh, on the mead here uh, that the camera's plugged into. And I'm, I am shocked that it's working as well as it is. Uh, the, uh, the camera that I've got is a, it's called a, the Revolution Imager uh, that uh, is from a, a local uh, Orange County Astron or Orange County Telescope. Uh, so shout out to, uh, to OC Telescope in Santa Ana. Uh, and uh, they hooked me up with a, uh, a USB adapter for uh, this camera that I'm just plugged right into my laptop here and streaming it through OBS. And it seems to be working great. Um, this is a, a camera that the astronomy department here at OCC uses all the time. Uh, it's a really, really neat little uh, toy. It comes with uh, a little LCD screen. So you can just plug the feed from the camera directly into that. You don't have to worry about software or drivers or anything. And it just displays it on uh, on this little monitor that you can put, you know, you can mount it right on the telescope. Makes it really easy to see. Uh, see stuff you don't have to you know figure out uh, how to look through the eyepiece I know that's uh, kind of tough for uh, people who you know, don't use telescopes a lot eyepieces can be kind of tricky to get it just right so you can see uh, what you're you're meant to be seeing um, yeah it's a, a really cool little uh, camera and it's working great plugged into my laptop and it's all being shot through this very, very cheap $25 plastic telescope that's mounted on a much, much bigger, much more expensive uh, telescope that right now is just being used to point the thing. Uh, the, the only purpose that it has right now is to keep keep the telescope pointed at the moon. I'm not using any of the optics in it. <laughs> Good stuff. You know, any telescope uh, for this will totally work. Uh, I, uh, I remember viewing an eclipse once with just a pair of binoculars, and that was still a spectacular experience. And this was like a cheap, like 40 millimeter pair of binoculars that I got from Walmart. So any optical aid will help you view the lunar eclipse. Yeah. The cool thing about the moon is that you don't need a powerful telescope to look at it. Uh, it's you know easily the the single easiest thing in space to look at. Um, you know, even if like just if you have good eyesight in general, you can make out surface features no problem. Um, the, yeah, the this little Galileo scope is a little two-inch refractor, uh, and it's supposed to be kind of similar to the the telescope that Galileo would have used to discover all of these cool surface features on the moon and uh, the moons of Jupiter and the phases of Venus, all things that help to you know helped our, our understanding of how the solar system worked, prove that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, uh, fun stuff like that. Good deal, good deal. So we're about 36 minutes away from the start of the totality phase, and at the totality phase, the moon will really begin to turn uh, blood red. Good deal. Oh, I thought of something fun to talk about. Um, so the... Uh, as of course everybody knows, the Earth rotates. It spins on its axis once every 24 hours, which gives us day and night. Uh, the moon also rotates, but it's tidally locked, uh, which means that it rotates at the exact same speed that it orbits. Uh, so the moon orbits around the Earth once approximately every month, and it does a full rotation on its axis in that same time which means that the same side of the moon is always facing towards us on the earth. Uh, so, you know, you hear about the, the dark side of the moon, which is kind of a misnomer. Uh, there is no permanent dark side. Uh, you know, there is a dark side, you know, the half of the moon that's facing away from the sun is dark. Um, but 
you know, what part of the moon that is changes depending on where the moon is in its orbit. What there is, though, and so there's not a permanent dark side or light side, but there is a permanent near side and far side because the moon, the same side of the moon is always facing towards us on the Earth. No one had ever seen the other side of the moon until we sent spacecraft to fly around the back of it. Good stuff. Uh, the Soviet Union took the the very first pictures of it with a very very grainy camera, uh, but the the first time any human being saw the far side of the moon with their own eyes was uh, on the Apollo eight mission. The first time they flew around the back of the moon. Good stuff. So I'm working on getting that view back from uh, our Tucson area. It looks like we do have a connection back with us finally. So let me see if I get that shared with you guys here. And there you have a view from our Tucson uh, viewing location. You can see a very good view of a tiny bit of a crescent moon left and won't be much longer now until that um, totality begins. We'll probably wrap up right at totality, right as totality is starting because it's uh, getting very early for all of us here. And at this point, you probably be want to experiencing totality for yourself. So, but we have our view back from uh, Tucson and you're looking at a tiny bit of a crescent left of the moon. So this is super exciting to see. And we also, we'll be switching again back and forth between our Tucson location and Scott's view in California. Good stuff. So I'm just looking around at the uh, the rest of the sky here. There's one star that's near the moon. Looks like that's yeah, that's going to be Antares. Um, I won't move the telescope and you know miss the moon. But right, uh, right now the uh, the moon is in the constellation Scorpius. Uh, the uh, the brightest star in Scorpius, which is just a little bit down and to the left of uh, of our real thin crescent moon right now, uh, is called Antares, which is a really, really cool star. It's a red giant, uh, so much, much larger than the sun, uh, but uh, a little bit cooler, so not quite as hot as our sun is. Uh, and its name is also very interesting. Uh, it comes from you know, Latin, Ant Ares, uh, which if you know anything about Greek and Roman mythology, you know that the Romans basically just stole everything from the Greeks and renamed it. So uh, Zeus became Jupiter, uh, Poseidon became Neptune, and the Greek god of war Ares became Mars. And so Ant Aries literally means uh, the rival of Mars because the star being a red giant has this really distinct orange color. It's a very bright star. Uh, and so you could be uh, forgiven for confusing it with the planet Mars. Good deal. So folks, we're looking at, again, a view from our Tucson location. And we can see that red of the lunar eclipse slowly making itself known. The uh, crescent moon, sort of, or the crescent that's left over from the Earth's shadow, uh, is still really, really bright. So it's very hard to see that bright red. I don't know what you're seeing in the sky, Scott, but can you describe what it's looking at right now, just to the naked eye? Uh, to the naked eye, I can see maybe a little bit of hint of the the red color. The you know the lit part of the moon is still pretty bright. And I don't know if it's just my eyes or if we've got some real high altitude clouds doing some refraction there. Uh, maybe it's just that it's super early in the morning and I haven't had enough coffee yet, but I've got like, you know, images, like double images of the moon uh, in the sky right now. Uh, but I think I can just barely see a little bit of the, uh, that red color on the dark part of the moon. Good deal. Folks, we have our, again, our Tucson feed, and we've upped the exposure quite a bit, and you can see that red coming in quite clearly now, the red of the lunar eclipse. This is super exciting. This is by far our best view of the night. Uh, this is just fantastic to see. It looks super beautiful in the sky, and we're just adjusting the camera up a little bit, but you can definitely see the hints of the red coming in, and we see a big jump in viewership now, too. Uh, Scott, could you explain really quickly again why, you mentioned it earlier on, but for those who are tuning in late, why is the moon turning red right now? 
Yeah, so uh, as the moon passes into the darkest part of the Earth's shadow, the Earth's umbra, um, the light that it's receiving is getting filtered through the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, it, the you know, cause of this red color on the moon is the exact same phenomenon that causes sunsets and sunrises to be all these you know, really colorful shades of pink and orange. Uh, the light coming from the sun has to pass through more air uh, to to get to you when it's you know when the sun's real low on the horizon, and the light gets filtered out as it passes through that air. And by the time it gets to you, all that's left over is the kind of red and orange light. And that's exactly what's happening to the moon. We're getting light from the sun filtering through the edges of the Earth's atmosphere and then flying on towards the moon and hitting it. Uh, and so we're kind of filtering out all of the other colors of light, leaving just the red stuff to hit uh, the moon's surface. And then it bounces right back to us uh, here on the Earth, and we can see it turning red. Good deal. This is such a beautiful view from our Arizona uh, location. It's mm -hmm. just wow. You got such a clear shot of the moon and you can clearly see those reds coming out. You can see hints of the lunar surface making itself known. And it's just absolutely beautiful to see in the sky right now. If you're out there in the West Coast, go outside. Don't don't watch the stream. Go outside and look at this <laughs> because this is so unbelievably beautiful. Just watching it from the live stream is just incredible to see. Uh, we're getting such a fantastic view right now and it's really looking good. So... Man, I, I'm, I gotta say, Scott, I'm just so jealous of you right now. I really am because this is such a beautiful, beautiful event to see. And every, like I said earlier, every eclipse is special. And this one is super special to see because, you know, it's the first one we've had in a while. It's It's been a while since we've seen a lunar eclipse. You know, some people are scared by lunar eclipses. There's nothing to be scared about. Um, People like we mentioned earlier, people like to call it the super blood flower ultra moon or whatever, as the media is calling it. That's nothing to be worried about. So this is just a lunar eclipse, the Earth, or the moon going behind the Earth's shadow. One of the most beautiful celestial events you can see. I can tell you a personal story. Um, seeing a lunar eclipse is one of the things that got me really inspired to do astronomy and specifically astrophotography. The one I think it was like in December. It was like a solstice eclipse around December two thousand. Uh, 10 and I remember looking at that and I was just stunned to see how much the moon just changed over the course of an hour you know it was like seeing my first thought was it was like seeing the moon just sort of go into reverse phases just suddenly go it suddenly was a full moon and then just like suddenly it was a half moon then it was a crescent and then it just turned red and it was just so cool to see that happen so I'm so excited and I'm excited that again you all are joining us and enjoying these live views of the lunar eclipse with us. We've got one pesky cloud that has just like covered up the whole thing. It's the only cloud in that whole section of the sky. Oh no. And it's right in the way. <laughs> no worries. Fortunately, we have our view back from Tucson. So yeah, it looks, between looks the, good in Arizona. Switching the two as needed. Georgie says, this filtering is used also to study the chemistry of atmosphere of planets orbiting the stars. That is a cool fact that I did not yes. know. Yeah, so uh, in exoplanet research, uh, we're you know, this exoplanets are planets that orbit other stars, so outside of our solar system, and it is a, a really, really new and exciting field in astronomy, uh, because of course, you know, one of the biggest things that astronomy you know, aims to do is uh, search for other planets that might be like the Earth, uh, where life could exist, and if if we can find that that is that's crazy that's the coolest thing that uh, humanity will have discovered in a very long time uh and if we want to you know figure out what these planets are really like because we can you know we can get estimates of their their mass how big they are uh how close they are to their star uh, but if we really want to understand what the 
uh, planet's atmosphere is like and what conditions on the surface might be like. Uh, we can look at the light that comes through the planet's atmosphere when the planet lines up with its star, kind of uh, like, in, like an eclipse. Uh, the star's light will shine through the atmosphere. We can collect that and we can break it down and see the chemical fingerprints uh, that are left in the you know, that are show what kind of gases are in uh, this planet's atmosphere. And if we find something that has, you know, lots of nitrogen and oxygen, then that tells us that it's a lot like the Earth's atmosphere. And that's kind of the, the gold standard. If we can find that, that would be one of the most exciting discoveries in all of like human history. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I'm still waiting for that moment when ET contacts us. Like in the movie, uh, Contact is one of my favorite movies. <laughs> Um, oh yeah love that movie it was a fantastic movie so yeah we're learning more about our universe and we're learning more about how our universe works and we're finding that the earth is not unique there are tons and tons of planets out there each just as diverse and interesting as the earth is we have not found signs of life on other planets yet orbiting these extrasolar planets but we have found signs of ox things like oxygen and uh, h2o in the atmosphere of these extrasolar planets so we're, as we learn more, um, especially with the James Webb Space Telescope coming online, which will be able to help aid in the search for extrasolar planets, we might be able to find the first signs of life outside of our solar system by looking for that chemistry of atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars, as Georgie mentioned. So very exciting time in astronomy. I'm so, so jazzed for James Webb Space Telescope. Um, uh, Scott mentioned it a little earlier on in the stream, but the James Webb Space Telescope is supposed to be launching later this year. It is the spiritual successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. It is an infrared telescope too, so it's designed to look further out into the cosmos, and that will be launching on an Ariane 5 rocket from French Guiana in October, I believe. So we're really excited to see the James Webb Space Telescope come online and be able to bring us those incredible views that we've come to love with the Hubble Space Telescope, but also to be able to really revolutionize our scientific understanding of the universe. So exciting time for space and science in general. Yeah, the, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be a you know, huge game changer in what we're able to see uh, way out in deep space. Uh, and it has been a long time coming. Uh, I was watching an old episode of The West Wing a couple of months ago from like, you know, 2004 and they mention you know oh the james webb space telescope that's going to happen soon and it's just been it's been delayed constantly and it's hopefully finally going to go up in october and uh when it does hopefully everything will go exactly right because you know, a, a telescope this complex with you know this many moving parts it has to deploy exactly correctly when it gets out to uh to the lagrange point where it's going to stay uh and uh you know, if if any one thing goes wrong, then there's really no saving it. Uh, as uh, you know, you may know the Hubble telescope when it was first launched had some issues with its primary mirror, and uh, they sent a space shuttle up to go and fix it. They had to you know replace a module and basically give it uh, give it contact lenses so that it could focus the light correctly onto the camera. Uh, with the James Webb telescope, that's not going to be an option. It's going to be much, much too far away to uh, to service. So they have to get it right on the first try. Uh, and JPL and you know, all of the you know, hundreds of you know, hundreds, but all of the different space agencies from all over the world uh, that have collaborated on the telescope are doing everything they can to make sure that it's going to go perfectly. Good deal. So I'm definitely seeing a pretty good jump in viewers now that we have, we are approaching that phase of totality. Um, if you're just tuning in, again, we're looking at a live view of the lunar eclipse tonight. Um, my name is Kyle. And I'm joined with Scott Mitchell at the OCC Planetarium in Costa uh, Costa Mesa, I believe that's how you pronounce it, in California. Mesa. Mesa, excuse me. Costa Mesa. And we're looking at a live view of that lunar eclipse. Uh, if you're tuning in, put in the comments again. I like doing this. I want, I'm want. i going to do it again because it's just really exciting to see all those people check again. But put in the comments where you're watching the eclipse from. And I will read out the comments as they come in because it's so exciting to see all the people checking in from across the United States and the world. Beautiful, beautiful view of that moon. 
Uh, Scott, are you starting to see that red come out? A little bit, yep. Can't wait for this these last little slivers of the moon to go away uh, so that we get that full total eclipse that we've all been waiting for. It's looking really good right now. We have Angie checking in from Marine Corps Base, Hawaii. I bet, man, Hawaii is oh, probably a fantastic yeah. view right now. And it's probably a little earlier in the uh, morning for you guys, too, so you're probably not as quite as tired. Phil's still watching in the UK in my garden in bright sunshine. <laughs> Sue is fighting clouds here in Layton, Utah. Honestly, I'm surprised that, uh, that it's this clear right now here as it is uh the you, know, you often you know, think of oh well sunny southern california you know never ever a cloud in the sky uh but in the summertime we get this marine layer where the the clouds come in off the ocean and it's just this huge gray cloud bank that makes it all overcast uh until like you know sometimes 11 o'clock uh in the morning and so far we're real lucky uh keeping it clear i was looking at the weather forecast all week uh and it said oh no it's gonna be cloudy it's gonna be cloudy but we're we're doing okay here right now for sure for sure so we have kathy watching from fountain valley california and we have mike watching from powers oregon too cloudy here it seems to be the theme of the night tonight scott is clouds and clouds <laughs> and more clouds so yeah. it's just unfortunate but I hope you guys were able to get at least a glimpse of the eclipse. Uh, if you haven't already, right now is the perfect time to do so. We have Donovan checking in from Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, clouds have ruined many, many an astronomer's night and dreams. Uh, yeah, the when you get a, a solar eclipse, uh, which is really really exciting to see, and very very rare to have uh, one occur in your area. So people travel from all over the world uh, into the the path of totality for a solar eclipse, and you know I feel just so awful for people that spent you know hundreds of dollars on plane tickets to fly you know to this one specific place where they're going to get the total solar eclipse, and then it's clouds, and that just must be the worst feeling. Yeah, I am. Um... I actually drove up to a place in called Etowah, Tennessee for the 2017 solar eclipse. Um, I was originally going to be going to St. Joseph's, Missouri, um, but the weather forecast changed the last minute, so I canceled my flight, and I was like, no, I'm not missing this. I literally, I was in college at the time, and uh, it was literally the first day of class, and I skipped the first day of class where attendance was mandatory to go drive up to Etowah, Tennessee to see the solar eclipse worth it holy cow that was such oh, an incredible yeah. experience i don't know if, if you viewed it scott or where you viewed it from but what i saw i remember just the experience of seeing all the stars come out in the middle of the day and it looked just incredibly beautiful yeah that uh so that eclipse was actually my my first total solar eclipse uh and i i got so so lucky uh i was in grad school at the time i was working at uh the planetarium we had at the university of maine and uh the my boss who was the director of the planetarium already had plans to fly to idaho to see it and then we got a call from a group that wanted a guide uh to come with them they were gonna uh get a, a private jet and fly i think we were they were going to go to north carolina uh to watch totality and because my boss already had plans i got to go uh and then at the last minute like the morning of you know i show up at the airport and they're like it's going to be cloudy in north carolina we're going to go to tennessee instead so they changed the flight plan we flew to athens tennessee and watched it from the tarmac uh and that was oh it was so cool if you've if you've never seen a total solar eclipse it's you know, put it on your bucket list. Uh, there's going to be one in April of 2024 uh, that passes through. Uh, I think it comes up through Mexico into Texas and then out uh, through uh, Maine and uh, Quebec and then goes out over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so if, if you can make plans to be somewhere on that path uh, to see that total solar eclipse, do it. Uh, and, do, and do it early because flights and hotels along that path are going to book up fast. Good stuff. Yeah. 
So the next loop, the next solar eclipse that'll be visible over the United States, I think, is that is another annual solar eclipse, and that'll be on October 2023. So just a little over two years from now, and that'll be followed by again the April 2024 solar eclipse. Uh, both of them will be worth visiting, and I am so excited for it. I was actually, you know, it's a funny story. I was so inspired. The first, the 2017 solar eclipse was my first eclipse too, and I was so inspired by it that I decided, like, okay, I'm never gonna miss a solar eclipse ever again. So I was like, I'm going to go travel. I didn't get an opportunity to travel to South America in 2019 to see the solar eclipse then because I had class. But in 2020, I had planned to go see the solar eclipse in southern Argentina. But, you know, because of COVID and all that stuff, things, airport and travel just became not a realistic possibility and didn't feel safe. So I had to cancel that trip. But I'm looking forward to coming out in 2020 three to South America to be able to get a good view of the solar eclipse then. So we're getting really close to that moment of totality. I'm hoping my internet connection holds in for another 14 minutes or so because we're just getting a fantastic view. Uh, live streaming takes up a lot of resources and a lot of Wi-Fi capability, a lot of bandwidth. So I'm just trying my best to hold in here for you guys. Uh, we will probably wrap up about five minutes after totality or so at this point you guys should be uh going outside and watching it if you haven't already but we're very very close to seeing the end and of the partial phase and entering that total eclipse phase so this is very exciting to see and this will be a very short total lunar eclipse you might be familiar with previous lunar eclipses where they've lasted for like 30 40 minutes fortunately for our sleep schedule tonight's only last for 13 minutes or so so <laughs> Yeah, cause I gotta, I gotta get in a couple more hours of sleep because it's it's just after four a.m. here, and I've got three virtual planetarium field trips to do today. Oh wow! So. Yeah, <laughs> I, that's, I, I, I'm gonna get a couple hours and then right back at it. I know the feeling. Uh, so we have Louis checking in from Pasadena, California. Hello from Pasadena, hey. California. We have Georgie checking in from cloudy New York, New York City. Hello, Georgie. Sorry for the clouds, man. That's really unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can for sure see the red now. Yeah, it's really starting to come out. Yeah, that looks great. If if you're in California or anywhere on the West Coast, as long as you don't have clouds, like don't do not watch the street. Go outside right exactly. now and look at this thing. <laughs> you can come back later and you know and listen to us talk some more. But you you got to see it with your own eyes. It's fantastic. If you're out there watching, you probably will have noticed that all the stars that were invisible from the moonlight have sort of come out. Now, granted, if you live in a big city and you have lots of light pollution, you might not be able to see that many more stars anyway. But if you're out at a darker sky location, you know, I've seen these really cool photographs of the total, sol total lunar eclipse where people have taken photos of the moon in front of the Milky Way. And normally that'd be impossible because the bright moon would make the, uh, would make the Milky Way invisible to any sort of naked eye or any sort of a uh, camera. But when the moon goes dark like this, it's dim enough that all of the uh, Milky Way is actually visible. And I think if a memory serves me correct, Scott, the moon is not far away from the Milky Way core tonight. It's in the constellation, I want to say Sagittarius or nearby Sagittarius. So it's close to that yeah, area. So right, it's close to that area. Yeah, right now the moon is in Scorpius and like the core of the Milky Way goes right through Sagittarius and kind of the tail of Scorpius. So uh, the the Milky Way, the band of the Milky Way is a little bit further south uh, than the moon right now. But yeah, the, the moon, as cool as it is, uh, you know, really messes up uh, any kind of you know, dark sky observing that you want to do um, just because it's so bright. Uh, you know, honestly, the, you know, a full moon, while it's, you know, it's cool, mostly just because of the light that it sheds back on the earth and it kind of lights up stuff more than uh you know you normally would see at night uh a full moon is is crap for doing astronomy um just it washes out everything else the you know a total lunar eclipse is the you know absolutely the coolest thing that can happen uh during a full moon uh but if you 
you know, really want to point a telescope at the moon, you want to do it when there's uh, when it's really any other phase, uh, like a first or third quarter moon are the coolest because you want to line up your telescope looking at the, the terminator, the line uh, between the day side of the moon and the night side, uh, because the shadows from all the sunlight light up the, the mountains and craters. And you can really see the cool detail. Uh, if you point a telescope at a full moon, it just kind of looks flat. Like you can see the you know, the dark and light areas, uh, but you can't really see the three D you know mountains and uh, and craters and stuff. Good stuff. So we have a couple more comments coming in as we approach that moment of totality. Uh, we Sue says, "I'm going to lose the moon behind the horizon." So grateful for this feed. Well, Sue, thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying the feed. We've had some technical problems, uh, which is kind of to be expected, but um, it's been great to see you guys here in the comments interacting with the. Uh, interacting with us and getting excited for this lunar eclipse. We have Lawrence says, cloudy here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, but the sunrise was wonderful. You know, I think the sun's up here in Florida now too, because the sky's all nice and blue and I can see some sunlight on the tree branches. So super cool to see. And we're only, we're under, we're under uh, 10 minutes now from that moment of totality. We're basically in it. It's not like a solar eclipse where when totality hits, it suddenly just turns, you know, from night and a day it's a more gradual process so we're basically in totality right now uh but we're very a uh, very little bit of the moon is still probably uh uncovered by the uh earth's shadow scott what are you seeing down there on the ground though uh so i can see just a tiny little bit of the uh the moon's uh surface lit up on the the top right portion uh most of it is dark but we've definitely got some of that red color now which is fantastic to see so that's our our blood what the blood super flower moon super flower blood moon right <laughs> yeah so i've just been warned that some clouds are about to come in over our tucson site so oh no <laughs> so we're just gonna we're gonna have to hope for our best here uh right now we're still getting good views of the eclipse but if it's not technical problems it's clouds tonight so we're trying our very best here but you know again if mother nature gets involved we just very little we can do mm -hmm. so we're about eight minutes away from the moment of totality which makes it sound way more dramatic than it actually is we're basically in totality right now thank you guys again so much for tuning in and sh joining with us to enjoy these live views of the total lunar eclipse uh, Dan says, no bueno here in Japan. High level clouds dominating the sky, hoping for some good luck. Well, Dan, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, like we said earlier, it's been the theme of the night. To... Clouds, clouds, clouds. Clouds, for sure. So we're getting there. You can also see a little bit of some of the different surface deep, some of the different surface features on the moon here as well as that red sword makes itself known. Uh, Sue's checking in again. She says, "Finally got a clear view with just a little time left before I lose it." Very red, gorgeous. I know it's super beautiful. Right. I'm so jealous <laughs> you're able to out get out there and see it. I'm stuck here in my room here in Florida, and I'm just so envious of everybody's it who's getting the opportunity to really see it. I can see this huge bank of clouds. That's our marine layer coming in from the south. Oh yeah. But hopefully, I I'll have enough time for it to get through totality before those really set in. Right. Hopefully. We won't be live for too much longer because again, we're fighting clouds at both locations, and eventually we're just going to lose that battle. So we will probably wrap up about five minutes after the totality begin begins. So we're about ten minutes from ending the stream, I'd say. So. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and enjoying these live views of the lunar eclipse tonight. It's been a long and definitely a difficult night, technically as well as weather speaking for us, but we're be able we're really glad to be able to share these views with you guys. Mm -hmm. And again, if you have any comments about astronomy or the nighttime sky or anything you'd like to know in general about the universe, feel free to ask them in the comments and we'd be more than happy to answer them. Oh yeah. It's literally my job <laughs> is to answer questions about space. Good man. Good man. So we're about six. I'm, I'm insufferable at parties. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's the guy over there. It's just, he's the guy over there who's explaining to everybody why Pluto doesn't deserve to be a planet. <laughs> That's how you know that you can spot the guy who works at planetary. He's like, oh, there he goes again. <laughs> uh, 
Louis saying they're checking in for Pasadena. Can't see anything. Ah, that's rough. Looks like we're starting to lose that battle to the clouds here again. Uh, Georgie says, imagine what it's like to be on the moon now looking back at the Earth. That's true. So if you were looking mm. at them, if you were standing on the surface of the moon looking up, you would actually see a solar eclipse. And that'd be such a wild experience uh, because the moon's much, the Earth's much larger than the moon. Uh, so, so the angular size from the moon looking at Earth is much bigger. So you'd see a much longer uh, solar eclipse, but you wouldn't be able to see things like the prominences or the the uh you'd probably see the corona but that's probably all you'd be able to see but it would still look absolutely beautiful i would imagine standing on the surface of the moon the apollo astronauts on the way back from the moon were actually able to see solar eclipses from the earth and they said it was just a jaw-dropping experience to be able to see the moon the earth just move in front of the sun like that and you know hopefully more astronauts will get to experience that view here very soon and again, you probably noticed the views are starting to get dimmer from our Tucson site. Those are those clouds starting to roll in. We're losing that battle, but we're not, we're not going to be live for much longer. Yeah, speaking of uh, uh, solar eclipses again, the, one of the you know, crazy cosmic coincidences is that the sun and the moon in our sky look almost exactly the same size uh the sun is approximately 400 times bigger than the moon but it's also almost exactly 400 times further away which means in our sky the sun and the moon look to be almost exactly the same size so when they line up in a solar eclipse the moon can just barely cover uh the sun and you see all of these you know the strands and filaments and the prominence is sticking out around the edge um so just a you know insane cosmic coincidence uh, that they just happen to line up that way. So Scott, if I'm looking at my calendar, my timer right here, we should be actually in the moment. We should actually be in totality now. Uh, I believe totality was supposed to start at 7:11 Eastern or 4:11 a.m. your time. So my timer was a little bit off there. I was just sort of rough estimating it, but we are now in the phase of the total lunar eclipse. This is the portion where mm -hmm. the moon will appear most red as it's fully engulfed by the shadow of the moon. This is so cool and so fantastic to see. We keep saying it, but seriously, if you have the opportunity, go outside and take a look at the lunar eclipse. We'll probably be live here for another five, 10 minutes because it just we're slowly losing that battle with the clouds. The uh, view of the moon has gotten dimmer uh, from our Tucson location as high clouds are rolling in. Yeah, the moon is just barely going to skim inside uh, the umbra. Uh, so that top right-hand corner, or I think in the, because it's flipped in the Tucson view, the top left is just barely going to stick inside the uh, the umbra. Because um, it's, it's not going to go right through the dead center of uh, the Earth's shadow. Uh, it hard, you know, hardly ever ever does uh just because you know it's it's rocks in space moving around and they're not going to line up perfect just because it's pretty for us here on the earth <laughs> good stuff I'm over here just cursing the street light right now. Uh, it's, it's just close enough that it's it's kind of ruining the view. I can cover it up with my hand though and still see good. <laughs> That's the problem with you know living in you know a big city. You know, Southern California has just so much light pollution. Uh, you can only see like you know a handful of the really brightest stars. Um, and so if, if you've never had a chance to like go camping, you know, way out away from the city lights and look up at the sky, you, you need to do it. Um, I've been, uh, doing a, a lot of camping over, you know, the pandemic and it's just so much fun to go out there, you know, in the mountains or in the desert or something and just look up and see, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of stars, uh, way, way more than, uh, than I can see from here in town. For sure. I remember um, I didn't actually see the Milky Way until I was like 23 or 24 years old. Um, I remember I lived because I've lived in cities all my life and I went out to a mountain called Steens Mountain in Oregon. 
uh, it's this beautiful mountain that you can drive right up the top to in a, just like an SUV and that was a wild experience but I remember it was in a location where there was no light pollution no light pollution whatsoever and it was mm -hmm. an altitude of 10,000 feet so as you get higher up you have less atmosphere to look through because our atmosphere you know has density to it and that sort of the lower you are the more atmosphere you end up looking through but if you get higher up you get a more clear view of the atmosphere and the milky way had like browns and blues in it it was so beautiful i've never seen anything like that in my life you could actually see the light on the surface of the ground from the milky way so that was absolutely incredible to see yeah i yeah i moved to california almost three and a half years ago now from maine and uh, maine is you know very very dark uh there's not a whole lot up there uh so we always had you know really really great views of the sky of course when it wasn't cloudy which it was most of the time uh so you know moving here with all of the city lights uh is uh is a little bit painful fortunately the, uh, you know i work in a planetarium so i can make it the sky look like whatever i want whenever i want very true that's uh that's the one benefit about planetariums like i mentioned earlier is you can see the sky whenever and a lot of these planetariums um scott do you want to speak a little bit about your uh like your what equipment your planetarium uses and why just like the views it generates and why they look so good because i remember anytime i visited a planetarium i'm just amazed by how accurate it looks like it's the feeling of being under a dark sky sky site looking at the milky way can you so can you speak a little bit about your planetarium some of the technical aspects about it and like what your projectors are and stuff like that sure yeah so the uh, the planetarium here in costa mesa uh where we've got a 50 foot diameter uh aluminum dome that we project the sky onto we've got these six big sony laser phosphor projectors uh, that give us this really nice crisp image uh, and uh, of course you know we can project the uh, the sky up there and show the you show the sky from anywhere on the earth at any time past present or future uh, i think the software that we run uh, is called digistar uh, it can go go r run the sky forward to the year like 999,999 uh and so you can see like you know, the actual stars moving as uh you know, the the sun travels around the milky way and uh, the constellation is shifting uh and then of course you know with a with a digital planetarium you can fly to any other place in you know, really in the universe, you can fly outside of the galaxy, fly around, you can go land on Mars, see what the sky looks like from the surface of Mars. Um, and it's just a, you know, a really, really powerful tool, especially for, you know, people that live in uh, in a big city where you don't get uh, a nice clear view of the sky. You, you know, you can go to the planetarium and, uh, you know, we all, you know, everyone that works at any planetarium that I've ever met uh, will be more than happy to just talk your ear off about anything that you want to know um you know i know that i just love answering questions uh every program that we do uh you know i, I try and end it with a, a q a uh and you know just talking about what the people are are interested and want to know about is is one of my favorite things to do um good deal so yeah we've got uh, we have a lot of fun at the planetarium here good deal and like if you're in the area, definitely visit uh, Scott's Planetarium. Uh, again, I can speak from personal experience. Visiting planetariums is one of the most incredible experiences. I also used to work in a planetarium before I started working for High Point Scientific. And anytime I was in my dome and just like presenting to the general public, it just it was just such an amazing and incredible experience. But again, we're starting to lose that battle to the clouds that we've been talking about. Uh, we knew that it would be a hit or miss situation tonight with a with the, the cloud situation as well as some technical problems that would inevitably crop up. But I think we're slowly starting to lose that battle with the cloud. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up here now because uh, we're about halfway through the period of totality. Again, my name is Kyle. Um, I'm a team member here with High Point Scientific and I'm joined with Scott. If you want to close out, Scott, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, thanks for, uh, for joining us, everybody. Uh, had a great time just talking about you know space and the moon uh i was worried about you know oh we, we gotta fill like three hours worth of just talking and you know somehow i always managed to do it because i just love talking about space so much
But yeah, if you're uh, in the, the Southern California area, uh, right now the planetarium is still unfortunately closed, but we're looking to reopen in September. Uh, so uh, look us up. We're the Orange Coast College Planetarium in uh, Costa Mesa, California. And so hopefully I'll uh, be able to see some of you in person once we uh, open back up in the fall. Oh, good stuff. Again, my name is Kyle and I'm joined with Scott tonight. It was very nice to be able to talk to you guys and I hope you guys enjoyed the views of our lunar eclipse and remember to always keep looking up. Thank you guys. Night.